Okay. So good morning, everyone. My name is Thomas, and I've spent the past months at the Institute of Marine Research in Bergen in Norway, where I was working on the behavior and the welfare of herring during commercial purse seine capture. And we had to focus on herring because we didn't have videos for the macro. And I'm going to present my preliminary results today. And So I want to start you off with a brief introduction to the fishing method. So commercial purse seining is actually one of the most important fishing methods of the planet as it accounts for up to 30% of global catches. And it targets schooling pelagic fish of different sizes, for example, um, anchovy, herring, of course, uh, mackerel, and tuna. And over here, you can see uh, um, a illustration of the fishing process. A uh, vertical hanging net is laid out around the school, which is then closed at the bottom, and this encaptures the animals in a purse-shaped net. The net is then continuously hauled onto the vessel, which leads to a dense crowding of the animals. And finally, the animals are landed onto the vessel using a fish, using a fish pump, for example. Um, important to mention is that not all catches are actually landed onto the vessel, but they're released because the sizes might be too small or the mixture of the catch is not optimal. And this is called slipping and happens by opening the net, for example. Um, and here, down here, you can see, maybe not as well, but it's a 350 ton large mackerel catch. So just to give you an idea how enormous these dimensions actually are. Um, so obviously, these high densities that the um, fish are being crowded to in the end, expose them to a lot of stress. And related to this um, density, there's other factors that can have negative implications on their welfare. For example, a lack of oxygen, abrasive injuries, or simply exhaustion. And why would we even care about the, um, be the welfare of these fish if we're going to eat and consume the them anyways? Well, um, as I just mentioned, a large part or a substantial part is actually not landed at all, but is being released by slipping. And um, these released fish can suffer from delayed mortality, which can occur up to 48 hours after they're being released um, and after experiencing these high levels of stress. So this will most likely go unnoticed. And um, also the welfare of the um, landed fish is important to think about because high levels of stress prior to slaughter can decrease the meat and the taste quality of the, of the fish. Um, now to my objectives of the project. Um, I wanted to monitor the behavior of fish during the capture and to, in general, better understand what is happening during a person um, procedure from inside the net. Um, I aim to identify the stresses the fish are experiencing and um, I also wanted to develop a standard and replicable method for analyzing behavior from 360 degree video footage. Um, and in order to obtain um, observations from inside the net, a uh, catch monitoring probe was developed, which doesn't show up on this slide, unfortunately. But it's a cylindrical probe, which has a 360-degree action camera and a Rinko ID logger, which measures um, physical parameters throughout the video recording. And most importantly, the dissolved oxygen concentration. And then the probe is developed as far into the net, which you can see down here. Um, there was also a video um, which doesn't play, unfortunately. Um, and it's deployed as far into the net as possible, where approximately the second half of the, um, of the fishing procedure is recorded. And these recorded videos were then analyzed for different metrics, for example, the location of the probe relative to school and net, the different length and levels of crowding density, uh, the schooling behavior and the contact the fish have to the net. And in total, I looked at 10 commercial herring um, captures. Uh, seven of them were landed, two of them were slipped, and one actually escaped because the, probe, uh, the net broke. <laughs> um, and here you can see a timeline of the different fishing operations. From the length of the bars, you can see that they're all in uh, differently long, and also the observation time, so the time we actually have video material from, which is depicted in blue and green combined, 
is different between each cast. And additionally to this, the observation, uh, the start of each observation relative to the total fishing operation is different between casts. So here it starts quite early and here fairly late. So this has had all to be taken into account when comparing the observations based on time especially. Um, now I'll quickly explain how I dealt with the 360 degree videos. Um, as you've all seen probably during uh, the workshop yesterday or the exhibition, you can choose, choose your field of view um, within the video. And this was obviously used to record as much information as possible, but this character was not ideal for a standardized video analysis. So what I wanted to do was to have a fixed field of view. So I split the videos in two and created a 180 degrees video to the front and one to the back. And these two videos were then separately imported in a program called the Observer XT, where I could synchronize, excuse me, <laughs> synchronize the um, videos with the oxygen data. And then I reviewed them several times. I scored different metrics and ended up with a data set, which where each second of the fishing operation was described by a certain level of density, uh, schooling behavior, and an oxygen measurement. Um, here are some examples of the different metrics I scored. So here about the density, I had five levels of density defined um, from small group, very low density to very high density, which I actually never observed. And this would be when the whole frame is dark because there's so many fish around the camera. Um, so I have four levels of density here. Regarding the schooling, I observed two groups of behavior. I had ordered behavior on the left here and disordered behavior on the right. And the disordered behavior, which is basically a breakdown of the schooling structure and they swim chaotically in different directions, was um, considered a response to stress. And then finally, I looked at the net contact the fish had and I observed single contact events on the left and extended contact for a longer period of time. And now on to some first results. Regarding the density, um, this plot shows uh, different levels of density, um, proportions per 5% of uh, the fishing operation from 50 to 100%, so the second half of the complete um, operation. And as you can see, there's lots of green and some bits of purple, which is, bo which is both low density. So the majority of the density observed was actually low. Um, the medium and high density, density levels were observed during the last quarter of the fishing, um, fishing procedure. And yeah, up here is uh, the landed observations and down here are the slipped observations. So high and medium densities were also observed before fish were released because this is only released fish. Um, and as I just mentioned, I never um, observed any extreme crowding densities and I wondered why. So I looked into the catch sizes of my observations and they were actually relatively low from 10 to 100 tons. Um, so I plotted them against the mean density score of each observation and found somewhat of a correlation, um, which is quite logical because the more fish you have in the same net volume, the means less space there will be in the end. But when we look at the, at the mean density scores, probably not uh, visible, but they are from two to 2.4 for all of my observations, which um, corresponds to a low level in general. Now onto the schooling behavior. For each observation, I created these overview plots to see if there's any um, trends that I could connect to any of the variables. So up here, I looked at um, water temperature over time and the probe depth just to see if there's any anomalies, which there weren't in any of them. Then I looked at the oxy oxygen saturation over time, which usually was pretty constant as well, and the um, density levels, which in this case increased nicely towards the end. And down here, each um, minute of the, um, of the fishing procedure or of this observation is um, displayed and the proportion of behavior displayed within this, this minute. And this is mainly blue, which is 
ordered um, behavior in the end, so no signs of stress in this observation. And this plot shows the combined observations of the behavior related to the different density levels I observed. Um, as you can see, again, the majority of behavior displayed is ordered, um, and there's a small proportion of disorder up here corresponding to a high level of density, which could be some first signs of stress, um, but yeah, the proportion is quite small relatively. Now to see if hypoxia was a potential risk um, on the potential stressor during the fishing operation, I looked at the oxygen measurements when the probe was located inside the school of fish. And um, as you can see here, oxygen saturation was always close to 100%, so no real risk of hypoxia. And also the differences between um, the le density levels were minimal. Nevertheless, I could um, see that the high density or the oxygen saturation during high density was significantly lower um, compared to medium and low densities. So maybe if the crowding would have been more extreme or lasted longer, there might have been a more drastic decrease. But this is just hip hypothetically. And finally, I looked at the net contact I observed. I tried to see if there's any patterns. So net contact is important as it can lead to these abrasive injuries and scale loss throughout the fishing operation. Um, so I related it to time where I couldn't see a clear pattern. It's, um, there's a very high variability of contact throughout the second half of the fishing process. But when relating it to the density, I found that the probability of them being in contact with the, with the net is highest when also the density of the fish is high. And finally, um, these were the results of my observations. And as I was also trying to develop a, replic a replicable uh, procedure to do this kind of analysis with these videos, I wanted to know if there was any observer bias on my part on the things I scored because I just used the observations and um, decided on what to score. And if the definitions I used were, could be used objectively. So I had help from three amazing students from the first year, which came to Bergen to do their professional practice in our group, Rita, Inigo, and Rui, and they reviewed part of my videos, scored the density and the schooling order, and I could compare all our scores with a statistic called the Krippendorf Alpha, which provides you with a value of zero, which um, if there is no agreement between the observers, and a value of one if there is total agreement. From our results, you can see that the density we um, density scores agreed quite okay with a value of 0 0.67. Schooling behavior, on the other hand, didn't agree that well. Um, so they might be subject to some kind of level of um, subjectivity. So to conclude, um, the catch monitoring probe and the videos recorded definitely provide unique observations of the person fishing process and the um, behavior of the fish during capture. Um, I could see some signs of stress related to crowding and the risk of abrasive injury was also present. Hypoxia was not observed, but as there was a slight decrease, it shouldn't be included as a pot excluded from the list of stressors. And catch sizes seem to be a determining factor. So if we could sample more and get larger catches and observe them, this might be, um, might clarify if this is the case. And there are some limitations I found during the analysis. So the front and the back field of view I created weren't actually as fixed as I had hoped because the probe was sometimes spinning around itself. So it would create overlapping frames. And as I just explained, the definitions of the schooling behavior might still be a little bit ambiguous. Thank you for listening and